Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. In this post-Christmas world of ours, when everything is almost back to normal, see if you can dazzle me at least once. What's new and exciting in your world this week? Let's end the year strong. Well, if you don't like this, I get to palm off the blame onto one of our listeners, Jessica Sims Bowen. I already know that Jessica needs to be blamed for what's about to happen. (laughs) She alerted us to the fact that Kraft, the maker of Philadelphia cream cheese, is actually paying people not to buy cream cheese. Yeah, I remember that. And I mentioned it to the wife and she went to the store and said, I don't know what you're talking about. There's lots of cream cheese. I can't speak to that, but at least up here in the Northeast, apparently there's a shortage. Kraft is offering early customers, not everybody, but the early customers, uh, $20 coupons for desserts that do not contain cream cheese so you can go buy something else. And this, of course, is caused by supply chain issues, but it reveals two interesting things. The first is the complexity of the supply chain. Cream cheese requires, as one of its ingredients, milk, which in turn requires trucking services to move the thing. The trucking services, because milk is a fresh product, requires extra licensing, and that requires labor, of course. The shortage of labor shows up all the way down the line and you end up with less cream cheese than what you would normally have this time of year. So you've got this complexity of the supply chain going on where you create this domino effect. The other interesting thing is contrary to politicians' claims that businesses are simply greedy, what this shows is that they are in fact loath to raise prices. What does Economics 101 tell you? That if there's a shortage of cream cheese, the price of cream cheese will go up. Kraft doesn't want that to happen because they are terrified, as most businesses would be, that you raise the price of your product, you just annoy your customers, they go away and they don't come back. And so what is Kraft doing? It's encouraging you to actually not use their product. More than that, they're putting money on the table saying, please don't buy my product as an alternative to raising the price. It all seems kind of goofy to me. It seems pretty straightforward if you take the long-term view, and maybe this is a third thing that it reveals. People often say things like businesses are only concerned with short-run profits, and that's simply not the case. They're very concerned with long-run profits. Now, there are circumstances in which the long run is so far away that they're going to pay attention to something closer to hand. But here you've got a situation where the business is concerned not about the sales it's going to make this Christmas season, but the sales it's going to make the next and the one after and the one after that. And they're willing to take a hit this year in exchange for a greater probability the customers will come back year after year in the future. I'm happy to say that when we first heard this news, I let it be known around the house that I would far prefer a blueberry or even a cherry or even a peach or even a pineapple pie. And I ended up not getting any of those things. You got none of the above. (laughs) Nor was there a cream cheese based dessert either. I want to read you a headline to see if you, a person not trained in the dark arts of political science, can see what's happening here. It's from the Washington Post just about 12 hours ago by an author named Duncan Hosey. With the Supreme Court lurching, state courts offer liberals hope. Now, immediately you should be thinking a case that looks a lot like a case that could undermine Roe versus Wade has made it up to the Supreme Court. And now they're interested in federalism all of a sudden. Federalism. Exactly correct. And how did we get here? I remember when liberals said, no, 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 what we really need is a one-size-fits-all rule that will govern our behavior at the federal level from this point forward. They got that. Now, when the chips are down, what's going on? They're looking to state courts. Exactly what they said we could not do, because that would yield 50 different answers, and we can't have 50 different answers. Yeah, well, listen, I'll take what I can get. I think federalism is the right approach. I think federalism is the right approach for almost everything. Yeah. It's a happy turn that all of a sudden liberals are interested in understanding the federalism that lies at the heart of the American regime. In the end, this is just going to be another stop on an argument that is not based in anything but political expedience. Yeah, there's no principle here. It's simply, I want this particular outcome and I'll do whatever it takes to get there. Yep, therefore. And you would have thought that that would have been the foolishness of the week. And yet it wasn't even close. Anthony Fauci has decided that what we really need to do is think about the vaccination rule for domestic travel. Papers. Yeah, here we go. 
because Anthony Fauci has been so right about so many things since this has started. Now he wants to be right about this, too. Anthony Fauci is unbelievably incorrect as a matter of course. And if you go back and just compare what he says to what actually happened, you'll see it clear as day. So he's talking about it not simply for flying, but what, train driving also across state lines? It's domestic flights that he's thinking about, but if and when they ever get that, they'll just turn to trains. And if and when they get that, they'll just turn to your car. Yep. We've been told there's a new variant. We were told that this new variant would hospitalize millions of people. And now, doesn't that sound like the thing we heard two years ago when this all first started? And if you look around, what do you see not happening? I see no one dying from the new variant. I was looking up actual numbers on uh, COVID projections for an article I'm writing. The early projections were for the United States 2.2 million deaths in 2020. We had, according to CDC, around 330,000. In fairness, one could say, well, maybe you had far fewer because of the lockdown, except that there are a number of instances in which we can compare what the projections were with a lockdown to what actually happened with the lockdown. And in every case, these projections were off by a factor of anywhere from 10 to 20. Right. Orders of magnitude. And we also could compare our country to places that didn't lock down at all, I believe Sweden. Right. And then another strange thing happened. Not only did far fewer die, but every time Fauci went on TV, he got more powerful. Shouldn't you have to be right at least from time to time to achieve that kind of status? To get more Ant and James, buy a copy of our excellent book, Cooperation and Coercion. You can find the paper and electronic versions on Amazon and the audio version on Audible. Phil Magnus is Director of Research and Education at the American Institute for Economic Research and a research fellow at the Independent Institute. Phil's research specialties include the economic history of the United States, the economic dimensions of slavery and racial discrimination, and the histories of taxation and economic inequality. In addition to prodigious research output, he has written for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Newsweek, Politico, Reason, and National Review. Phil, you've been on Words and Numbers a number of times before. We're always happy to have you. You've written on a topic that appears to be a hot topic, and it's something that I'm kind of embarrassed to say I don't know anything about. So I thought a good way to learn was to have you on Words and Numbers, and I can ask you lots of questions. It's probably the case that this is the only place that Phil is welcomed. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Certainly on this one. The topic is critical race theory. Right. Can you just start from square one? What is this thing, and why is everybody upset about it? That's the interesting thing about critical race theory is it's notoriously ill-defined, even in the literature that espouses it. And we hear this in the media, some of the critics that have popped up in the last few months for political reasons that are talking about regulating critical race theory in the classroom or it became a campaign issue in the recent election. The proponents of it always come back to them and say, well, can you define critical race theory? And oftentimes they're aimless and they're wandering on that. But then if you ask any of the people that are practitioners in the critical race theory field, can they offer a succinct definition of what it means? It turns into word salad. It's just blather that goes off in all sorts of different directions. The way that I tend to define it is I look at it as a subclassification of a broader philosophical movement that we refer to as critical theories. And critical theory, classically speaking, it came out of an offshoot of Marxist thought in the 1930s. And the idea behind it was that you could divide philosophical approaches to the world into two categories, critical theory and traditional theory. Traditional theory propped up the establishment power relationships. It propped up things like capitalism that Marxism was trying to tear down. It propped up hierarchies and told historical accounts that were very oriented around whatever party happened to be in power. Well, a critical theory challenged that. It put itself forward as an emancipatory movement, but emancipatory in a very far left Marxian sense, proletarian labor upheaval. Now, the original critical theories as they came out of the 1930s were almost entirely focused on labor and class as the main dividing line of society. What happens with critical race theory, they take that general framework and they supplant class with race is the dimension. There are other types of critical theories. There's critical gender theory, for example, that would use gender as the line. 
There are critical theories that apply to you know anything and everything. There are even journals that purport to do these things called critical food theory or critical university studies. It's critical blank theory, whatever happens to be in there, then that's the group that's the dividing line for the unit of analysis. But what critical race theory did, and this really popped up starting probably about the 1970s through the 1990s or when the core texts are written in this literature. This is a law professor by the name of Derek Bell, Richard Delgado, Kimberly Crenshaw. These are the major theorists, the founders of critical race theory. And what they do is they use race as the unit of analysis, the unit of divide in trying to understand power relationships, power hierarchies. One of the arguments that's put forth by this is that racial minorities are the emancipatory unit. They're the persons that have been oppressed by power structures and systemic hierarchies, and they develop an entire philosophical system around how to tear those down, how to break down the structures that they argue are imposing racism. So it sounds actually very noble in its goals, and I think on a very base level, a very superficial level, it does present itself as something that's very agreeable. It's ending racism in society. But what they do is kind of a Mott and Bailey routine. There's the fallacy of the Mott and Bailey that's come from medieval castles, where the Mott is the top of the hill, the defensible point, and the Bailey is the town down below the castle. Well, a Mott and Bailey argument takes the strongest component of that, anti-racism, and uses it to import everything else that's in the Bailey. And that's where you start getting anti-capitalism, you start getting some pretty far left economic ideas, other ideological baggage that's imported in. And that's really been the trick of what critical race theory has done ever since it established itself as a literature. They put forth a proposition, they say anti-racism and tie it to power structures, thinking that's unobjectionable. Everyone can get on board with that. But then the power structures happen to be, we need to overturn liberal democracy and overturn free market capitalism, need to embrace Marxian social upheavals and revolutionary movements and some really fringe stuff. But when you challenge them on that, then they retreat back to the mod. They retreat to the high point and say, well, we're just defending a position of anti-racism. We're opposing discrimination. That's essentially where the controversy is today. And more than that, Phil, they look at this and they say, and you are a racist. Anybody who disagrees with them is a racist. There's literally no way around that. That's point. exactly how they say it. And one of the things they target... The notion of a colorblind society and colorblindness under the law, that was one of the major early focuses of critical race theory in the academic literature. We think of legal neutrality as a mechanism for a judicial system, a mechanism for legislation, that the law is colorblind, justice itself is blind, and you weigh the facts of the case under uniform principles of law. Now, in practice, it doesn't always uphold that way. In practice, we have many, many historical instances of bias being introduced into the courtrooms, but the legal theory, the aspirational goal of the law system is to be neutral. Justice is blind, including colorblind. Well, critical race theory says that's impossible and says that anyone that is espousing colorblindness under the law in the court system is actually espousing racism. So it becomes a non-refutable hypothesis. Right. I'd refer to it as a philosophical tradition that has acroamaticism to it. This is an old term, goes back to the ancient world, the notion that philosophical truth is delivered by training under a select person that has access to that knowledge. It's passed from the master to the student, the professor to the student, and you have to be trained in that to understand it. Well, critical race theory and most critical theories what they do is they put themselves forth as only the people that are trained in critical theory are seen as proficient to comment on this. And either you train in critical theory and therefore accept it, and therefore you have access to the knowledge, or if you challenge it from the outside, well, you're attacking it and therefore you're a racist or therefore you're a classist or whatever the dividing line happens to be, the form of bigotry on the other side of that. So I don't want to jump on this too hard, given that I'm just beginning to understand it, but it's starting to sound a lot like a religion. That's fair. This is my belief, and any evidence that comes along to support my belief, well, that's good evidence, and any evidence that comes along to refute it, well, there must be something wrong with that because it contradicts my belief. And, Ant, this gets a lot weirder than you think, because use the language of religion, I think you're right to do so. But really, this goes back to the anti-religion of Marx. Oh, that's absolutely. And the Marxists, right, because they all say 
you're in false consciousness if you don't see the obvious truth before you. And it becomes utterly irrefutable because no matter what criticism you level, you're in false consciousness. That's exactly it. They purport to have identified the issues of the racial group, just as Marx purported to scientifically identify the interests of the class groups. So what they've done is that they've taken a Marxian framework and they've reoriented it to race as the main unit now. And don't forget about the feminists who had consciousness raising sessions. They had these group activities to get you to the point where you too could be irrefutable. That's exactly it. It's anti-scientific in a way. And this is why you see, if you read these academic journals that have moved very heavily in the critical theory traditions, and this could be critical race theory, it could be any of the others, what you find in them is the papers that are published in these things are often, for lack of a better word, unscientific dreck. It's word games going on for pages and pages, intentional obfuscation. It's what the philosopher Harry Frankfurt called, and I'm using this in the philosophical sense, he called it bullshit. Hmm. And bullshit in the philosophical sense is an act of obfuscation to deceive. It's an act of putting forth pretensions to make your reader think that you're onto something really, really deep. But what it comes down to is it's like word games to insulate the person that's making the argument from having to face any more substantive or scientific criticism. It's interesting drawing the parallel to Marx theory, because at least in economics, Marxian economics has become a fringe thing. Absolutely. And it's become a fringe thing, I would argue, because the evidence has become very clear. And of course, you can point to things like free markets prospering where socialist markets don't. But what's more telling to the average person is that the distinction of classes has disappeared. And not entirely, but largely. The working class person puts his retirement portfolio into stocks, and now he's actually a capitalist, right? Does critical race theory face the same demise? The distinction amongst the races becomes less and less as we intermarry and our cultures merge and so forth. And certainly the distinction between black and white in America is much less clearly defined today than it was 50 years ago. Do you think critical race theory just dies the same way Marxist thought has largely died? You know, there's an interesting question there because I think in an open exchange of ideas, the long tendency over time has been to reject prejudice. We've moved away from that through moral suasion. We've moved away from that through economic forces. You know, this was the big point that Gary Becker made in his 1957 book that eventually wins him the Nobel Prize in economics, pointing out discrimination. He says that under the right circumstances, the right institutional arrangements, markets themselves work against discrimination. It's not like a magic solution to discrimination, but you think about this, if you're a shop owner, why would you segregate your shop and tell a third of your customers that they can't buy things from you? Right. So there's a mechanism at play there. And maybe it's not the only mechanism because sometimes that shop owner is also governed by racist laws that say he can't have those customers in a store. Sometimes it's governed by long cultural norms and traditions that had worked in very insidious ways. So it's not saying this is an easy thing to overcome, but there are certainly pressures from civil society that work against discrimination, that work against racism. Now contrast that with the dialogue that's emerged around critical race theory. Here's one of the great ironies. You have this movement that's kind of taken hold in a really niche area of academia, not much else. Elite academia, maybe some of it spilled over into education in general, and some of it spilled over into the media classes. But beyond those fields, you don't see a lot of people walking around as advocates or activists for critical race theory. And yet, if you look in academia, where critical race theory is most pronounced, you find it's a very combative, hostile approach to studying race. It's one that views other competitor theories of examining racial discrimination, including the problem of racial discrimination, and writes them off and then excludes them from the conversation. And asserts this is the only way that we can understand race. And if you don't buy into it, you're a racist and therefore you're evil and deserve to be ostracized and insulted and berated. (laughs) Right. And that, again, it looks a lot like religion. (laughs) That is exactly it. Sure. But this is exactly the point where it gets very, very weird. People, I think, should never be surprised at the lunacy that comes through American universities. The critical race folks have somehow managed to get out of the university, and they become the pebble in the shoe of all kinds of different people. 
when you get to the point where regular people are up in arms debating this at the level of their own school boards, the worm has turned. Now, I've met a lot of high school teachers, and none of them have anywhere near enough time to become critical race thinkers and to introduce this into their classrooms. And yet, everybody is kind of convinced that teachers are shoving this down the throats of students nationwide. How did we get there? But the strict academic study of critical race theory, it's limited to a few high-end journals It originated in law school. This is one of the arguments that the defenders of it have put forth and say, well, nobody but people in law school study critical race theory. That's not true at all. You can go into English journals, history journals, education journals, and it's there. So it's certainly at the top in elite academia. But at the same time, what's going on is that the heavier discussions of this, the jargon-laced theoretical discussions of this spill over and distill, and I dare say, dumb down forms into other forms of education. One of the other movements that emerged almost simultaneously to critical race theory, they called it critical pedagogy. So another of these critical theories, this was really in vogue in the late 1960s is when it burst onto the scene. There was a theorist by the name of Paulo Freire who writes a book called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Give you an idea of how influential this is. It's depending on the year, it's either the first most or second most assigned reading in education programs for teaching teachers, people that are trying to get their teacher certifications to go into K through 12 education. Now, are they studying and reading this book at the highest of high levels? No, but they are reading it in the same sense that like a political science class would read the Federalist Papers. They get the basic ideas. That is worked into the curriculum at its core, and critical pedagogy has deep and direct sympathies with other forms of critical theory, including critical race theory. So you get a like a bullet point version, the Cliff Notes version of critical race theory from the academic journals makes it into the undergrad curriculum for a lot of teachers and for a lot of the humanities as well. So they get a superficial version of it, but it's a version of it that gets the basic ideological points, and that carries over into the classroom. So by the time it makes it to K-12 through education, no, they're not writing dense, jargon-laced journal articles in the critical race law reviews, but they are doing these bullet points, kind of dumbed-down classroom exercises that we're hearing about that parents are all up in arms about like separating students by race to talk about their privileges. You know, you have kindergartners and telling them that they have to sit in certain corners of the room based on their skin color, which actually sounds to be like it's a racist throwback to an earlier era that I thought we were beyond. And yet they're putting this forth as if it's like an anti-racist exercise to separate people, separate but equal, I guess is the narrative here. Separate students like eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds by race and put them through these really superficial, and I dare say silly, and yet ideologically loaded exercises in the classroom, parents are seeing that they're going to the school boards and they're pointing out, say, what the hell's going on here? Why are you separating my daughter, my son into groups for this? Why are you telling them that they are racial oppressors or that they are racially oppressed? And the teachers themselves probably could not give an elaborate explanation of what critical race theory is, but they are certainly using the bullet points version that they've inherited through the curriculum. How widespread is this in our K-12 schools? It's really hard to measure. I've tried to get indirect metrics of something like this. So that's where the free air pedagogy of the oppressed, finding that that is one of the top assignments on teachers' education program syllabi shows that there's something there, something that's being carried forward. The other thing that we've seen a lot of, and I'd say in the last decade or so, a lot of school districts in response to a variety of things, part of it's a reaction to Trumpism, part of it's consistent with the growth of the Black Lives Matter movement. Educators and administrators are saying, well, we need to incorporate more race consciousness into our curriculum, which, again, I'm not opposed to. I think it's perfectly fine to talk about the history of discrimination, history of slavery, some very real social problems here. But what they do is they'll establish, say, we're going to do a diversity and inclusion initiative and insert that into the curriculum Then they go look for texts that are going to inform that, and they're drawing on texts that are given to teachers that are coming out of higher education that are almost entirely this very narrow, one-sided view of how we understand race relations. How pervasive has it become, really? Is this the flavor of the week? 
because it seems that teachers come up against these really terrible ideas sequentially over time. And this just seems to me to be the next one in a long list. It has agitated parents a lot more than the other ones. But, you know, look, I meet a lot of high school teachers and they don't really care about this. Now, some surely do, or we wouldn't hear it day in and day out on Fox News the way we do. But I'm wondering what kind of toehold do they really have here? It's like a squeaky wheel phenomenon here. The people that are practitioners of this stuff, up until very, very recently, up until it kind of became a political issue, it flew under the radar in a weird way. Yeah. But the people that espouse critical race theory that work on this, and then the educators that inherit that perspective, they champion, they almost valorize activism as an academic yeah. mission. So your purpose is not to go become a college professor to teach literature, teach history, teach art. It's to instill your students with becoming political activists of a certain stripe. This goes back decades upon decades, really in the late 60s and early 70s, when faculty started making the case that activism should be included alongside traditional research and teaching that qualifies you for a job or for tenure. And that's gone through multiple iterations. It's gone through its flavor of the month, like you were saying, around various different social causes, almost all of them of the left. One thing that we have seen in higher ed, and this is where I think this time has a little bit different from previous movements like this. So higher ed's always leaned to the political left from time immemorial, but it hasn't been overwhelmingly left. It hasn't been hegemonically left. You can go back to the 1960s, and if you polled the faculty of American universities, and they did this at the time, about 45% would identify in the political left, and then maybe 20% would identify as moderates. Another 20% would identify as conservatives, and then there's a category for the rest. And that was a stable historical pattern really until about the early 2000s. So its first survey that started to show signs of a shift was 2004, and this has played out over the last 17 years now. We moved from about 45% of faculty on the left to now it's like 65% of faculty identify on the left in a very, very short period of time. And you break down those numbers even further and you find it's the far left that's driving that shift. What used to be the far left in universities like the Marxist and various offshoots of Marxism were about 4 to 5% of the faculty. Now it's like 12 to 15% will openly identify as that. And that's only happened in the last 15 to 20 years. So you see that kind of a shift taking place. And I think what it's done is it's made this a much more pronounced force, whatever their fashionable topic of the moment happens to be, which is critical race theory right now. It'll be some other critical theory probably in the near future as they shift and reinvent. But now it's something much more to be reckoned with at the university level. And over the last 10 to 15 years, I think the most pernicious outgrowth of this has manifested. And it's those statements that you have to make when you apply for a job in the academy. You have to have your diversity statement. And there are wrong answers to that. Absolutely. If you say, yes, I'm absolutely in favor of diversity, therefore, my right-leaning political positions should receive an equal hearing. That's a dude who does not get called for an interview. Maybe a value that would have been perfectly acceptable 15 or 20 years ago. You say that I believe in racial colorblindness. We should treat all people equally. That's a no-no now, especially on these committees. Some universities, they're attaching diversity officers. This is something that's really exploded in the last 15 years, is they went on a hiring spree of these diversity bureaucrats, a vice president of diversity who has 50 people under them. And there have been empirical studies of this to see if it's actually improved the racial climate on campus. And the before and after comparison, nothing happened, nothing changed. But what they ended up doing is they hired a bunch of diversity crats and they're paying them $100,000 a year or higher salaries that are basically drawn off of student tuition. So it's a way to create administrative bloat right. that does absolutely nothing. And yet they insert themselves into hiring decisions. They insert themselves onto syllabuses, onto curriculum decisions. They campaign and lobby for additional mandatory classes and diversity to be added. And, you know, that sounds great in the abstract, but what it really means is 99% of those classes are going to be taught from a very narrow critical race theory type perspective, you're never going to get another version of diversity in the diversity class. 
It's ironically very non-diverse in the intellectual sense, but very heavily ideological in one direction. So you went down the path of looking for evidence, which raised in my mind a question going back to the stuff that's going on in K through 12. And you gave an example of kindergartners separating them out into two sides of the room. In the critical race theory literature, has anybody stopped to ask the question, do demonstrations like that actually improve race relations or or harm them? Or is that a question you're not even allowed to ask? I'd say in the worst cases of it, you are not allowed to ask it. I'm certain there are some researchers out there uh, just by statistical probability that have asked those questions, but they're not prominent in that literature. They're shoved aside. And I think this really comes back to the whole religion point, the whole derivative of a Marxian way of thinking. And you go back to classical Marxism. There's another interesting thing. So like the classical, hardcore, class-based, proletarian Marxists, the people that follow Marx in the 19th century, hate the critical race theorists because they're a schismatic bunch. It's Stalin versus Trotsky kind of a thing going on. (laughs) But with classical Marxism, the whole premise there, Marx didn't need to test his theories because he thought he had already found the scientific answer. And the scientific answer is that class interests have a unity and they will play out across the course of history through conflicts with the oppressor class and eventually will emerge victorious. Yeah, one does not submit faith to experimentation. That's exactly it. And you supplant class with race, and race is now the unit of analysis, but the same methods, the same approach, the same dialectic is the notion of how you divine and figure out what is supposed to be. It's like asking the question, do these things actually work, is a complete side issue to them because the critical race theorists already know, they've already convinced themselves that their approaches work. And to even ask that question means that you're undermining the emancipatory aim of the critical theory. Wow. So, Phil, if we've taken one lesson away from this, it's that any use of the word critical should be examined pretty closely. <laughs> it should be examined, yeah. And theory, for that matter. <laughs> and theory. Criticize sure. the critical. That's the- well, it's interesting. When they capture word usage, that's a meaningful step towards being victorious. When you can get everybody else to use your words They're actually using your categories. And when that happens, all bets are off. They love their jargon. If you read these academic papers, it's just layer upon layer of jargon, terms that they invent. And they're often some very, very banal concepts. One that I've written a bit about, which comes straight out of the critical race theory literature, so intersectionality analysis. And this comes from Kimberly Crenshaw, one of the co-founders of the discipline. She wrote a series of articles in the late 80s, early 90s on intersectionality. Well, what is it? She draws off of analogies from a traffic intersection. And she says that we can map this on to concepts like the legal system. The intersectionality metaphor, it's actually a fairly practical observation in the most simple sense. It's that an African-American may face discrimination, a female may face discrimination, but an African-American female will face a different type of discrimination than those individual components when taken alone. I'd argue that this is a concept that we have intuited basically since time immemorial. This isn't a very deep thing, but she's given it a new term. I can go you one better on this. I said exactly those words to my mother when I was eight years old. Hmm. I remember the conversation because on the news, I would hear about discrimination against women and discrimination against blacks. And I said, isn't it true then that black women face more problems? And my mother said, of course. This is intuitive stuff. And it's also something that's existed in social science for basically as long as we've had modern statistics. What is multivariate analysis? It's taking all these different variables, and one of them could be gender, one could be race, one could be sexuality, one could be class. All the different possible explanations of something are not going to aggregate neatly, and it's the job of the social scientist to figure this out. This is something we've been doing for as long as we've been able to intuit about these categories, and yet what the critical race theorist did and Crenshaw did is she jumps in and she states this very plain intuitive, almost commonsensical observation. And she states it in a very banal way, and she gives it a metaphor, and she gives it a new term, but then she does the Mott and Bailey routine. So that's the Mott, that's the castle at the top of the hill. Everyone would agree that Black and female face discrimination in different ways than Black alone, than female alone, 
that's where they hook everyone to agree. And it's like, okay, well, therefore intersectionality analysis, let's go down to the Bailey. And it's this heavy ideological far left imported priors. If you accept intersectionality analysis, therefore Marxian economic systems are something that we need to go by. And you see this in Crenshaw's Hmm. work. So one of her most recent books She opens with a broadside against public choice theory and economics and just declares that it's racist. She says it's built on racism. Therefore, this entire subfield of economics should be discarded. Just states it off the back. It's not something she's ever studied herself in any meaningful sense. She certainly hasn't looked at the empirics behind it, but her analysis has almost a priori adopted this premise that if you don't agree with all the ideological importations that are attached to this very simple concept, you're on the outside. You're racist. You don't need to be engaged. You need to be just automatically dismissed from the conversation. And if I've read some of your stuff correctly, she lodges this charge of public choice being racist, not because of anything that's said in public choice, but rather By association, she claims some of the founders of public choice were racist, therefore public choice is racist. You see, genetic fallacies are very pervasive in this, but they're often genetic fallacies that are made of myths. So the notion that if somebody associated with something historically was racist, therefore everything that came from that idea is forever tainted. This is what cancel culture, the cancellation of historical figures that believed in something bad or did something bad, and therefore all of their ideas can be thrown out. But what you find is often these people are very poor historians. So in Crenshaw's case, I'll put it out in the open, what does she cite to justify that public choice is racist? Nancy McLean's Democracy in Chains, a conspiracy theory tract (laughs) that was basically written by this left-wing nutcase at Duke University who imagined that James Buchanan was this mastermind of trying to prop up segregationism with public choice. I've worked very extensively on McLean's book. I've written a lengthy rebuttal to it, and I've dug through basically all of the archives that she looked at and then some that she didn't. And what you find is that time and time again, she was misrepresenting evidence, in some cases very willful. And yet it aligns with the left-wing political narrative that Crenshaw just happens to inherit and adopt as her own. So what does she do? She declares, based on Nancy McLean, that public choice theory is racist. And this has gone throughout many other areas of the critical theory literature, not just critical race theory, critical gender theories, all the different ones. Every time they mention public choice theory since about 2017, when this book comes out, they always refer to this one text, Democracy in Chains, as if this is the end-all argument, therefore we should discredit it. Phil, we're about the end of our time here, and I suspect a lot of what you said today is going to sound very interesting to the people who listen to the podcast, because they know there's a problem here, not quite sure of its contours. And I think you did a great job of pointing that out. Tell us, how can people get your work into their hands? My most directly relevant work on this subject recently has been what I call one of the many offspring of critical race theory, and that is the New York Times' 1619 Project which if you remember back in August of 2019, they published this flashy magazine about reinvestigating American history through the lens of race and through the lens of slavery and racial discrimination. The subject matter on its surface is not a bad subject matter. It's something that is worthy of historical investigation. It's an area that I've worked on for two decades myself as an economic historian of slavery. The problem with the 1619 Project is it adopted an ideological tone in a single one-sided ideological narrative as the overarching driving message of the entire project. And this really comes from the editors at the New York Times. Nicole Hannah-Jones is the chief editor, and she's probably the main perpetrator there. Interestingly, she describes herself as an adherent of critical race theory, but it's not the high-minded academic journal version of it. It's the bullet point version of it, the K-12 through classroom derivatives of critical race theory. They just issued a new book edition of it that expanded and went much more aggressively in the political direction on critical race theory. They brought in Ibram X. Kendi, who's kind of a popularizer of these types of notions, popularizer of anti-racism, and he calls himself a critical race theorist. Get it straight from the source itself. They're identifying themselves as sympathetic to this. 
But what it does is it creates a very one-sided political narrative of American history that looks a lot more like 2021 progressive far-left politics than a factual reinvestigation of the past. Just last year, I published a book-length rebuttal of the 1619 Project, the original version of it that came out in the New York Times. It's called The 1619 Project, A Critique. I may be borrowing one of their tactics here. The name critical theory, where do they get it? They look to philosophers before them, and they say, well, what is a critique of traditional theory? Deep historically is Immanuel Kant's critique of pure reason. And then the one that they all liked in the 1930s, Karl Marx's Das Kapital, what's the subtitle? A critique of political economy. So their critique critical theory, and you know, I'm doing a little bit of turning the tables on them, saying, let's critique a form of critical theory by offering a factual analysis of the issues that are involved here, the history of race in America, why is slavery important to study, but also why is it important to study in a way that's not loaded with the ideological baggage that this one particular perspective has tried to bring to bear on it. Where can people find these books you keep writing? The easiest place is to go on Amazon and search for 1619 Project to Critique. I also do essays on a regular basis, as James knows, because he's my editor at AIER.org. And then I also put out quite a bit in academic journals that are working on the history of slavery, the economics of slavery, economics of racial discrimination. Phil, as always, it's been a pleasure having you here. And I like to think of you as the guy from whom a torrent of words comes. You just start talking and here it comes. And yet it never ends up as word salad. It's always really great. I suspect all of our listeners are going to love it. Yeah, appreciate you having me on. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Phil. And that's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Join us next week when we have somebody, I don't know, more interesting than Phil? Probably not. Good luck with that. Yeah, and until then, you can keep up with us. Our Twitter handles are in the show notes. We'll even put Phil's there because he's just as crazy on Twitter as he is everywhere else. You can join us on Words and Numbers Backstage where the conversation continues. What else, Ant? You can send us all email at wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. And I got to tell you, I've been receiving some crazy email lately on that address. You haven't seen anything yet. Wait till they hear Phil. <laughs> I guess that's right. And that's crazy that I look forward to. That'll be good fun for us. In the meantime, go about your business. Be nice to each other. I don't know why I have to keep saying this. Maybe we don't have a global audience big enough to affect a change of any kind. But for crying out loud, it's not that hard. Be nice to each other. And we'll see you next week. See you next week, James. James.